The energy sector continues to dominate as a stock market performance leader. So how long will it last? Plus, how can you squeeze more dividend income despite rising inflation? Stick around for the answer. Paul Bayaki with SS&C Alps Advisors joins us right after this. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Stephanie Stanton. It is great to have you with us. Be sure to subscribe to ETF Guide TV and post your thoughts in our YouTube comment section below. Well, the energy sector has been one of the stock market's brightest areas. Not only is energy the top performing S&P 500 industry, but major changes to the global energy sector are now at work. So how can you tap into some of these major trends? Well, we are pleased to have with us now Paul Bayaki with SSNC Alps Advisors. Paul, it is great to have you with us. Great to be back. Nice to see you again, Stephanie. Likewise. You know, energy is the top performing S&P 500 industry sector this year. It has outdistanced other sectors by a pretty wide margin. And the Alarian Energy Infrastructure ETF, and that ticker is ENFR, has also been lifted. How does ENFR differ compared to the S&P 500 energy sector? And why is infrastructure so important? When you think about energy infrastructure and relate it to our everyday life, when you go to your gas station, for example, and you fill up your vehicle, there's gasoline coming out of the pump, and that gasoline comes from our refinery, mostly in the United States. But in order to get that gasoline refined, you need the feedstock, which is crude oil. And that crude oil comes through a pipeline from a production site somewhere in the United States, one of the major basins producing crude oil or from the Gulf. And ultimately, it's that infrastructure that connects production to consumption of both crude oil and natural gas that is so important economically. And that's what these companies in ENFR provide is those services, whether it's the transportation of crude oil and natural gas, the storage of crude crude oil or or natural gas, the processing of natural gas and natural gas liquids, and increasingly so, the actual liquefaction of natural gas into a form, LNG, that can then be exported globally. And to your point about the changing global economic landscape and global energy markets, we know for a fact that There's increasing demand for U.S. LNG in Europe, in Asia. The market for U.S. LNG continues to increase, not just as a result of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and the cutoff of supply of of Russian gas to the Ukraine, but also, or to Europe, I should say, but also when you think about just the natural evolution of the build out of LNG facilities in the United States, these companies in this portfolio operate all of those various services and all of that infrastructure. And ultimately, when you think about XLE, for example, that big broad energy ETF that owns the largest energy companies in the United States, there are some companies in ENFR that are also in XLE, Kinder Mori. Kinder Morgan, Williams, One Oak, but there's also a number of companies that are not in XLE. And those companies are very different in their profile. Like I said, they own these assets, these infrastructure assets that connect production to consumption in the United States and increasingly globally. But the nature of their business is also different. When you think about your typical refining company, for example, they make their money off the difference between what they pay for crude oil and what they're able to sell refined product for, whereas infrastructure companies charge a fee for moving a certain amount of volume around the country or processing it or storing it based on leases. And those pipelines that cross multiple states that are regulated by the federal government uniquely have a measure of inflation, PPI for finished goods, adjusted for their industry specifically, that insulates them somewhat. The fees that they earn, they insulate them somewhat from the pressures of inflation. So unlike other pockets of energy, there is some inflation defensive mechanisms embedded in their operations that is unique to the energy space and unique to the markets. And so when you think about ENFR relative to, say, XLE, what you end up having is a much more stable business in terms of the nature of their cash flows, the defensive orientation of those cash flows, but also some of the inflation escalators that are embedded in their operations. And then finally, when you look at the yield, XLE energy is the highest yielding sector in the S&P 500, up near 4%. But 
on a relative basis, the yield on the NFR is significantly higher, up near 6%, and that's largely owed to the fact that these companies are by nature high yielding equities. Let's move on. The Biden administration announced policies aimed at dramatically reducing carbon dioxide emissions in the U.S. This is part of a goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. Meeting this goal would require, of course, some major changes to the U.S. energy sector overall. What do you think this will mean for investments like the ALPS Clean Energy ETF, which, of course, is your ETF? Uh, That ticker is ACES or ACES. Um, What do you think this is going to mean for that? Ultimately, it means that there's going to be opportunity for development and investment by the companies in ACES. And in theory, they're going to be investing alongside the government. So when you think about ACES, it captures seven different themes in the renewable energy space. So it's not a pure play solar strategy. It's not a pure play wind strategy. Yes, there are solar and wind companies in the portfolio, but it has electric vehicle exposure. It has battery exposure. It has hydrogen exposure. And so capturing those multiple themes that are going to be part of this energy transition is what makes ACES a compelling way to play on this energy transition. But I think importantly, getting back to our previous discussion about legacy energy companies and energy infrastructure companies, you don't necessarily have to forsake one for the other. And I think oftentimes investors think about this in a very binary way where it's either I've ha- I get renewable energy exposure or I get legacy energy exposure. But the reality is, is as part of this carbon reduction plan or carbon dioxide reduction plan, They've increased the price that the government's going to pay for carbon dioxide. That's sequestered. That's captured. And energy infrastructure companies are in the business and will be in the business of transporting, storing, and capturing carbon, as will large legacy energy companies. And so when you think about the transition and what it means, it means more electric vehicles on the road, which means more electricity demand. And ultimately, natural gas will have to play a big role in that transition transition because ultimately it's very important in terms of the inputs for electricity generation. And so companies who are in the business of supplying natural gas, producing natural gas, transporting natural gas will have a large role to play in it, as will companies who, like in the energy infrastructure space, have strong expertise in the transport of what is essentially molecules. And those molecules can be crude oil and natural gas, as they typically are now, but it will also likely be carbon dioxide, hydrogen, renewable renewable natural gas, renewable diesel at some point in the future, if not now. And so I think the beauty of ACES is that it gives you exposure to these emergent companies that are investing in technologies that will allow us to transition away from our reliance on fossil fuels. But in the, in the same vein, it's worthwhile to note that what makes energy so compelling in this market relative valuation, strong fundamentals, and a compelling macro backdrop also makes them really relevant to an energy transition because, again, these companies, at least in XLE, those large established energy companies have the balance sheets, have the cash flows to invest in some of these technologies alongside some of the emerging companies within ACES. Yeah, I mean, you you bring up a good point because everyone wants to pit, you know, uh, renewables against fossil fuels. And, you know, it sounds like at the end of the day, everyone's going to have to come together at some point. Um, All right. You talked about inflation a minute ago. As we know, it's been running hot. Um, Investors, they're looking for stable rising dividend income to offset increasing expenses at the grocery store and pretty much everywhere else. The Alps Sector Dividend Dogs ETF and the ticker is SDOG. Hats off to you, very clever, Um, has a very unique approach to dividend investing. Plus, it's also got a value investing bias, which has been in favor. Tell us a little bit more about it. It's a fairly simple strategy in terms of how the portfolio is constructed, and it leans on what has been a long-followed investment approach in the market, where the dogs of the Dow theory, which was invented nearly 40 years ago, posited that if you buy the highest yielding stocks, In the Dow Jones Industrial Average at year end, those stocks are likely to revert to the mean in terms of their relative performance. And so you borrow that high level simplistic methodology and instead of pulling from just the 30 stocks in the Dow Industrial Average, you instead pull from the stocks in the S&P 500. And what you do is you pick the five highest yielding stocks in 10 of the 11 gig sectors. And by nature, you get higher yielding stocks, which on a relative basis means a likely higher 
higher yield than the market, but perhaps more importantly, it gives you balanced sector exposure to the 10 of the 11 gig sectors exclusive of real estate, but also it gives you a cyclical value bias, which in this market environment has largely outperformed growth-oriented portfolios, partly because when you think about the dynamics of inflation and what it does, it certainly compels the Federal Reserve to increase the federal funds rate. And we've seen an increase in interest rates across the board, whether that's the two-year rate, whether that's the 10-year rate, whether that's the 30-year mortgage rate, which most people look at when they pay their mortgage rate statement. And so ultimately, when you have increasing interest rates, that means an increasing discount rate for cash flows in a free cash flow discounting model. And if that discount rate is increasing, then the cash flows that are further out in the future become less valuable in the present time by virtue of that time value of money concept. And as a result, sectors whose valuations aren't as high, or quote-unquote value sectors, in theory have less relative discount and less premium or multiple compression in that environment. And that's what we've seen play out in terms of the relative performance of value strategies compared to growth in 2022 and really dating back a couple years now. And so SDOG really fits in that context. And when you think about the stocks that it's been picking picking by, by virtue of the index methodology in a given sector, you've also gotten out performance from some of the, uh, the individual stocks in the portfolio on a relative basis to, say, the S&P 500. And year to date, it has outperformed the S&P 500. Moving on, uh, last question. Real estate is another haven for income investors. The Alps Active REIT ETF, which the ticker on that is REIT, R-E-I-T, is an actively managed fund that has delivered some pretty impressive results versus index-linked peers in the REIT sector. Could we be entering an environment that favors active management over passive management? Certainly, if you look at the latest results from the SPIVA report, which gives you a feel for how active managers have done relative to their passive benchmarks, 2022 marks the first year where we've actually seen some outperformance above that 50% threshold by active managers in aggregate. And I think that's reflective of the fact that this is, as many people have said for quite some time, a stock picker's market and active managers have been decrying the environment over the course of the past decade or so where low interest rates have ultimately generated out performance of index strategies relative to active strategies. And so we certainly believe that there are pockets of the market where active managers with a strong foundation, a strong research process in place can generate meaningful outperformance. And in the case of REIT, we certainly believe that is one of those segments, largely because when you think about the real estate market and at the index level, what types of exposure you have, you typically have a significant amount of exposure to tower companies and to data centers. And that's not necessarily what most people associate with their real estate investments. And so the folks who run that strategy, GSI Capital, are a group of folks who have been doing investment research in this category, have managed institutional portfolios for quite some time, and they have expertise in valuing these companies, valuing their properties, valuing the relative industry and sector weights within the real estate segment. And as a result, they're able to leverage those unique insights and that unique research process to pick and choose relative industry weightings, relative company weightings in the real estate sector. And in theory, over time, leverage that into relative performance. And when you think about real estate, it's something that most people generally have exposure to through the house that they live in. And they now, perhaps more than ever, are aware of the fact that the commercial real estate market is very much fragmented as a result of the changes in the working approach of companies between hybrid workforces, fully remote workforces, and the, the footprint of real estate for many companies in the United States has had to evolve. And the valuation of those properties has also had to evolve as a result of decreasing increasing demand for corporate footprints in commercial real estate and the evolving nature of our economy. And in theory, relative to a passive benchmark, that expertise, that experience in managing portfolios of real estate can allow investors who are looking for alternative ways to get exposure to a segment, to your point, that historically has had above average yields in a way that leverages that type of institutional quality expertise. Yeah, so much good information. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great to see you. My pleasure. Nice to see you as well, Stephanie. 
And be sure to visit alpsfunds.com to learn more about the ETF lineup at SSNC Alps Advisors. I'm Stephanie Stanton with ETF Guide. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.